confident. I think I'm ready at least. Mike Semper VB here with you for the next hour talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts. Something we do every single day here on this program. Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com. Over the air affiliates like the Mightier 1090, Sirius XM 156. Via podcast or streaming on Twitch or YouTube. I just want to say thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today. As you can see and hear, Brian Alvarez is not spending any time with me today. I'll leave it up to him to explain where he is. As I was telling producer Dom before the show, it's the type of adventure that sounds like it could turn into, you know, like one of those Ben Stiller movies. With Brian's luck, that's kind of more up his alley. Maybe if he wanted to work blue, it could turn into like late era Rodney Dangerfield. You know, maybe something like that, but... I don't know. Producer Dom had a a better vision of what Brian could be doing right now. It's almost out of like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But unfortunately, that's where I have to build you up and leave you for right now. And if you're a subscriber over at WrestlingObserver.com, you can get the rest of the story when Brian rejoins Vinny for the Brian and Vinny show coming up here very soon on the site. But there is a lot to get into today, news-wise, in the world of professional wrestling. It is the middle of the week. Dynamite was last night. It is Shark Week on the Discovery Networks. We had a wild barbed wire match it was it was a, it was a spectacle actually spectacle would be the right word to use between Eddie Kingston and Chris Jericho and I will run down that entire show for you we have matches being added to the Ric Flair weekend and I'll tell you about that when we get back from break Ring of Honor's pay-per-view was built up heavily on AEW show last night and possible returns of both Kenny Omega and Adam Cole coming soon. I'll let you know the details on that when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Semper Vivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live. We do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day. But if you want us 24-7, you can find us on Twitter. I am at Semper Vivi. The timeline for this show is at W-O-N-F-4-W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid Atlantic Pod. I don't know if you guys know this or not, so I need you to. It's maybe, it's maybe a little bit shocking. So I'm going to need you to sit down for a moment. If you have Xanax to take, grab a bar of it right now, put this in. It's maybe just shock you to the point of no return. So I need you to be ready here, okay? Because I'm not sure if you've heard this or not. Ric Flair is having his last match coming up at the end of the month in Nashville. Have you heard about this? I hope that doesn't shock anybody. I hope the news has been out there enough. I hope you understand. Having his last match. Ric Flair's last match dot com is where you can get all the details for this. It's going to be the Nature Boy teaming up with his son-in-law, Andrade El Idolo, to face off against Jay Lethal, who has been training him for his comeback, and J-E-F-F-J-A-R-R-E-T, Jerry's kid, Jeff Jarrett. The whole weekend's going to get started on Friday, July 29th, with a roast of Ric Flair. Probably going to get out of control. I would assume. The next day, you can come back to Earth a little bit. You got panels with Brian Danielson, with Claudio Castagnoli, or whatever Brian calls him. You got a horseman reunion. You got Bret Hart talking about SummerSlam 92 on Sunday. The former page, Soraya Jade Bevis, Mick Foley, Kevin Nash, a whole bunch of other people as well, too. Part of the biggest StarCast yet, StarCast 5. They're doing pictures, autographs, all the same convention stuff that you're used to. But this time around, pro wrestling. Probably better than podcasts. And with the way that this lineup looks, better than the podcast they probably have had in the past. Although I've heard Kevin Nash, his podcast is really, really good. 
and Jeff Jarrett's I know is good. So if they're doing podcasts this weekend, that's a good thing. Jeff Jarrett's going to be doing a lot that weekend, obviously. Making money for sure. But there's going to be Black Label Pro, Game Changer Wrestling, New Japan on Saturday, Ric Flair's last match on Sunday, an 11-match card now. And it's all going down. Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Tickets are still on sale, $39 at Ric Flair's last match. I'm going to use that as a transition to keep talking about that weekend. Because regardless of what you think about Ric Flair wrestling one more time and being back in the ring, and how the whole thing has come together and happened. Regardless of any of that, that's a really good show that they've put together. A really good show. And a really eclectic, unique show. And it got added to last night and today. Last night, ROH champion Jonathan Gresham will face off against Kanosuke Takeshita, Allen Angels who's recently departed from AEW, and Nick Wayne in a four-way that was announced on their social media. That was last night. Today, Crimson and James Storm, both notable for their runs in Impact, have joined Bully Ray to be a part of the Bunkhouse Stampede. It's not the Bunkhouse Stampede. They don't own the rights to that, but the Bunkhouse Battle Royal now. Gresham's going to face Claudio uh, uh, coming up on Saturday at Death Before Dishonor. So he may not be the ROH champion, and maybe Claudio in that match. I don't know if Gresham loses, that he would still be in there. But that's now, uh, it's 11 matches that are all set for this. Flair and Andrade against Jarrett and Lethal, with Karen Jarrett in the corner. Impact World Championship, Josh Alexander against Jacob Fatu. Impact Knockouts Champion, Jordan Grace against Deanna Perrazzo and Rachel Elring in a three-way Ricky and Kerry Morton with Robert Gibson against Brian Pillman Jr. and Brock Anderson with Arn in his corner. Jonathan Gresham against Angels Takashita and Wayne. Ray Phoenix against Laredo Kid against Taurus versus Bandito in a four-way. The American Wolves, Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards against the Motor City Machine Guns, Alex Shelley and Chris Sabin in a matchup that kids from the early 2000s are, you know, again, all those guys, Shelly still being able to go out there, him coming back. I just, all of that I love. Killer Cross with Scarlett Bordeaux against Davy Boy Smith Jr., Clark Connors against Ren Narita in a New Japan representation match, and the Briscoes against the Von Erics, Marshall and Ross, as well as that Bunkhouse Battle Royal. So, again, even if flair isn't your bag <laughs> the rest of the show they actually put some real effort into this and again i i like it's supposed to be a tribute it's supposed to feel like an all-star event with rick flair getting crowned at the very end of it and hopefully not mickey rock style you know what i'm saying but you know it's supposed to be a celebration and to have this unique lineup i i, I definitely got to give him credit for that and MLW, uh, I guess with Jacob Fatu getting representation on that show. They're also going to be represented uh, in New Japan uh, during Music City Mayhem that weekend as Clark Connors is now challenging Davey Richards for Richards' National Open Weight Championship. And the match had been announced before the stipulation. This new twist was just added to it today. So that lineup is also looking really good. You got Moxley and El Desperado in a no-DQ match, which... Everybody that listens to this show knows I'm way deep in the tank for Desperado. He has no problem going out there getting wild with Moxley. It's probably going to be a really, really fun match. If not a, a pretty damn, I'll say good one, if not great. Kushida against Alex Shelley. Again, just two great veteran legends going at it junior heavyweight legends going at it. FTR and Alex Zane against Aussie Open and TJP. That's a really interesting match on paper. Interesting teaming there. Hiromu Takahashi against Blake Christian. This seems like a natural matchup. You know, Hiromu against Alex Zane. Hiromu against Blake Christian. Seems like it makes perfect sense. By the way, there's a, a little thing I heard about Blake Christian's run in WWE. And something you're seeing on NXT now. That made me laugh, and I don't know how out there it is, so I won't draw the connection together, but 
It was very, very amusing when I heard it. Hopefully I can give you more on that. That's just a little tease, just being a jerk. Hopefully I can give you more on that later. Not today, though. Probably not today, unless I get blown up with a bunch of texts. But New Japan Strong Openweight Championship also on that show. Fred Rosser against Big Damo, who we've had on this show. Hopefully we can have him on again. Both of those guys have been on. They've both been great guests. National Openweight Championship, as I mentioned, Davey Richards against Clark Connor, And then Shota Omino, Fred Yehai, and Yuya Uemura against Ren Narita, Kevin Knight, and the DKC. Fred Yehai, we had Dr. Keith Lipinski on. Last week, talking about AAW, he was the AAW heavyweight champion, had really good matches against Mance Warner, really good matches against Josh Alexander. His size is always going to be a detriment to him making it to a higher level. The same thing goes with Jonathan Gresham, but because there is Terminus, which is Gresham's own promotion, but there is Ring of Honor, there is New Japan Strong. The possibilities for a guy Fred Yehai's size go up immensely. And there's a couple of guys I'd love to see work New Japan when things open up a little bit more. Chris Bay being one of those guys I'd like to see in that division. And I'd really like to see Fred Yehai get some more work in New Japan strong, then go over and attempt to ply his trade over in Japan. Not saying he's going to be a big star or anything like that, but as far as looking at a list of new names who could come in there and kind of shine things up a little bit, he's one of those guys I really like. Him working with Zack Sabre Jr., him in a six-man with Zack Sabre Jr. and Taichi working against somebody. I just think he's a nice little fire plug that can actually work in good situations, so hopefully this opens up some more doors for him. When we get back from break, a lot more stuff to get into. We got the Dynamite review coming up and some news on some Dynamite performers, some pretty big names, Adam Cole and Kenny Omega talking about their injuries and talking about when they hope they can be back. I'm Mike Sempervivi, Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. If you're driving around right now, salute to you. If you're working overnight, you're working at your job, you're able to throw the podcast on, we appreciate you for choosing us, any of us here at the WrestlingObserver.com slash Figure Four Weekly, FigureFourOnline.com Empire. I'm old, so I come from the weekly era. But uh, all of the shows that are not with Dave Meltzer and not with Vinny or Granny are free to the public whether it be the Adam and Mike Big Audio Nightmare, Josh Nason's Punch-Out, Carl Stern, Les Thatcher. Doesn't matter who it is. If it's a show that doesn't have Dave or Vinny on it, it is free to the public. Check out some of the shows that are featured over at WrestlingObserver.com, and you never know, you may become a subscriber and have access to like 13,100 million videos and, and podcasts that are up there, as well as all the Wrestling Observer newsletters from, from the past. New one added, I think, every every couple of weeks. And obviously, Dave, every single week is pumping that thing out. A new one is going to be out tomorrow morning, Friday morning. And Dave has got some some news on Kenny Omega after being out of action for almost six months. Kenny Omega is hoping to be back in time for September's All Out on this morning's Wrestling Observer Radio, only for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. Dave Meltzer said Omega is hoping to be at All Out, but it's too soon to say if he will or if he won't. He's hoping for it. That's kind of the target right now. Meltzer went on to say that September's show is also the targeted return for AEW World Champion CM Punk, who has been out of action for nearly two months after surgery on what is believed to have been an injury to his foot, possibly diving into the crowd and hitting it on a guardrail. If Punk does return, it is virtually a lock says Dave in the front page here of the WrestlingObserver.com website, that he will be in a unification title match against current interim title holder John Moxley. On Tuesday, 
Fightful reported that an Omega Young Bucks trio tag team match is tentatively planned for All Out, but Meltzer did not confirm that on this morning's Wrestling Observer Radio. After losing the title to Hangman Page at last November's Full Gear, Omega took time off to have several surgeries for nagging injuries, including his knee, a sports hernia, and more. And he is very frustrated right now, whether that is part of a work to leave up to him coming back I don't know but he's expressed frustration with having the time off and having these injuries not heal in the way that they want to, you know that he wants them to and that his people want him to and at least he's getting some time off because his body absolutely needs it if there's any benefit to Adam Cole being out right now after suffering a concussion at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view, it is the same thing, and that's something that he brought up during an appearance on GameSpot's Wrestle Buddies podcast, where Cole addressed his recovery. He said he's confident that he's going to be able to return to the ring soon. He's dealing with a torn labrum as well as the concussion effects and the after effects that took place during the Fatal 4-Way IWGP World Heavyweight Championship match last month. He says, I'm doing okay. I'm definitely on the path, on the track to recovery for sure. I have a great team around me that is helping me and just making sure that I'm taking care of to the best of my ability. AEW has been fantastic as far as making sure that I'm getting the right care that I deserve. And I feel like there's progress and a move forward every single week for sure. Cole talked about being banged up. He said the most time he has ever had off in the last 14 years was one month, but he says he feels good. He says he's very confident and he'll be back in the ring soon. He's excited to be back. He says, I miss it so much already, but yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. So a good sign for Adam Cole fans. Jay White defeated Cole and Kazuchika Okada and Hangman Page to retain the IWGP World Heavyweight title at Forbidden Door. Uh, though he thinks he'll be able to return soon, Cole did admit that the concussion he suffered was, quote, definitely scary. Dave Meltzer reported in last week's edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter that Cole has opted not to undergo surgery for his torn labrum and is instead doing therapy for the injury. Forbidden Door was the first time that Cole had wrestled since May's Double or Nothing pay-per-view. So Adam Cole, Kenny Omega, CM Punk being mentioned in there as well, all possibly coming back some point soon. And I do have the whole Dynamite review that's going to be coming up here, but I'll go ahead and cue producer Dom right now to bring up the promo last night by Cash Wheeler and Dax Harwood. And we're not going to hear the entire thing, but we are going to hear Dax Harwood's portion of that promo. It's just too good not to be played he has done an incredible job this year, not only in the ring, and that's over the last several years, at both of them, for their entire careers. They've done a great job building themselves up and putting them in a position to be looked at as one of the great legendary tag teams in an era where there are so few. There really are. If you think about it, you start thinking, and it's like, man, we talked about the machine guns. You know, do the Wolves make it to that level? I don't know. You know, if the Kings of Wrestling, were they around long enough? Their work certainly, you know, was great. But the Usos, the Briscoes, the New Day, if you look at them as like the new Freebirds, but like the Young Bucks, there's not a lot of teams. And even though there's a lot of people that talk tag team wrestling, you know, there's very few promotions that really push it in, in that way. And in that important way, and there's very few guys that are willing to stick with it long term and not tease things when they work indie shows where they wrestle against each other, but then they team over here and all that sort of stuff. No, FTR is a team. They are one unit together, you know, so Dax Harwood, Cash Wheeler have been great. Dax Harwood opening up about his mental issues, opening up about some of the struggles he's had as a man with his body image, with dealing with failure in your professional life on the highest stage in WWE, and not only 
failing because you believe in so much of what you're doing and you believe so much of what your vision of your job is and your career and pro wrestling is and to fail at a spectacular level. And not only that, and they didn't fail. Yes, they won titles and things like that, but look at how they left. Look at the kick in the balls they got literally on the way out the door from all those legends, something that weighed on his mind so heavily, and he's been so open about how that affected him. And that's been awesome. And you hear Dom jumping right now. He's good. He wants to play it. He's got to play it. So we're here. So, uh, so there's this little, uh, there was this little five-year-old. My bad. Your, your pregnant pauses threw me off. You know, I'm knocking you out. You just go ahead and play it now. Ruin this great moment with Dax talking about his daughter and whatnot. Dax Harwood last night, AEW Dynamite. The best. You're, you're off the mic. It's, it, it's fine. It, it's playing. Oh, okay. It's playing. <laughs> the uh, CT scan and MRI to see what's going on. So they went to the cardiologist and uh, they found out this little five-year-old girl had a hole in the bottom of her heart. And... Uh, the doctor told the parents, if this little girl worked hard and she fought hard, she could overcome this and that hole would close up on his own. But if not, they would have to do open heart surgery, which, you know, is a big risk for a five-year-old. So fast forward three years later, and this little girl, she goes back to the same cardiologist and he does the x-rays, he does the MRIs, and he looks and the hole is completely closed. This little girl worked her ass off. She fought her ass off to make sure she was healthy. And that little girl, the eight-year-old girl, is my daughter. And if that little eight-year-old girl will fight that hard for something that's not promised to her, well, daddy's got to do the same thing. Saturday night, Saturday night, daddy's got to fight that hard to bring home the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championships and bring home a legacy she can be proud of. Saturday night. I love y'all too. Saturday night, pay-per-view, death before dishonor, Briscoes. I'm gonna fight like an eight-year-old girl. <laughs> and I'm gonna beat your ass. Top guys, out. And there it is, the stage is set. What a story from Dax the Axe there. Still happy for his daughter. Like More coming up. Absolutely. Absolutely. There you hear it, Dax Harwood. Cash Wheeler got a promo last night on AEW Dynamite. I thought that was the best way to promote coming up this Saturday's ROH Death Before Dishonor pay-per-view. Their match coming up against the Briscoes. That ain't Dax Harwood. That's Dad Harwood. And he has become the dad to a lot of professional wrestling fans out there. He is. He's the dad. He is. He is officially the cool dad, Dax Harwood unbelievable he and cash wheeler first match with the briscoes was something else this one probably going to be the same way tony khan during media press doing media and, and all that stuff leading into the show today has mentioned that the briscoes are signed to roh full-time long-term contracts and they're going to be a cornerstone of the future we'll get into that more as well as last night's dynamite shark week when we get back you hear that? Kevin Gates. Two phones. One of my favorite songs. I don't know why it is. It just is. I got two. Big wrestling fan. Was there last night. AEW Dynamite. Going to get in that review here in a moment. But as I was mentioning before the break, Tony Khan... Uh, with speaking with the media, talked about the fact that the Briscoes are factored in to the future of the company. They are some of the biggest names in Ring of Honor history, Khan said. They are Hall of Famers. There are some others, that, but I think that would be a great example of a key act where they haven't really appeared in AEW yet, but they are assigned to Ring of Honor and me. There are the Briscoes and a couple of other developmental wrestlers, uh, Tony Khan said. Fightful reported this past March that a person of influence within Warner Media did not want the Briscoes signed to AEW because of homophobic tweets that Jay Briscoe had made in 2013. Uh, Briscoe has apologized for those tweets during a March appearance. 
on the Battleground podcast was the last time that he had did it. Ring of Honor uh, had smacked his hand and I think suspended him and, or fined him. Uh, initially, when it had happened, it had completely decimated any possibility that they were going to have to sign to WWE. So it looks like they have a future with Tony Khan and, and in Ring of Honor. Obviously, that's the key match on Supercard of Honor. So that's what you got going on there. Dynamite last night. Fighter Fest Week 2, show number 3, Gas South Arena, Duluth, Georgia, the old Gwinnett Civic Center Arena, Discovery Shark Week. I don't know if you've heard that. Sunday, it begins. Dwayne Johnson making an appearance during AEW programming. He is going to be the master of ceremonies. They've been doing this now for 34 years. In 2020, 21 million people watched over 10 days. It is apparently the best way for them to get new eyeballs onto the channel. It is no surprise when more people return to the channel than at any other time during the year. In April of this year, Discovery Incorporated and Warner Media merged to become Warner Brothers Discovery, and everybody has got to do something sharky. TBS, TNT, True TV, Food Network, HDTV, CNN, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, Animal Planet, Science Channel, ID, Oprah Winfrey, Turner Classic Movies, Discovery Plus, and HBO Max Plus will all have Shark Week-inspired content or cross-promote the event as Dynamite did last night. But we didn't open with a shark. We opened with a king, Brody King and Darby Allen alongside Sting. King was shown with a singles record of 11-2. and two. Darby Allens was 62-23-1. And, and I thought, aren't records supposed to be reset every year? Or is that just the rankings? None of that matters. Although the uh, Chiron did say that uh, after uh, King threw Allen out of the Royal Rampage uh, last month, and they did a callback uh, to that very same spot where King used the choke sleeper on Darby Allen, hung him over the top rope before dropping him to the floor. Darby Allen was able to drag his carcass back in the ring, ate a gonzo bomb, took the loss. Brody King dominated three quarters of this match. Darby Allen got some of his signature spots in, flying through the ropes, made everything look, you know, wild and good, but he was there to take a beating uh, from Brody King, and he absolutely did so. Afterwards, Sting came out to stop the carnage. He was able to almost get the Scorpion death drop onto Brody King when the lights went out. When they came back up, Malachi Black was across from Sting, Brody King locked on the choke sleeper. Sting got misted in his eyes by Malachi Black. Tag team match coming out soon, I would assume, between those two sides. Completely fine with it. Completely fine with all of those guys in the ring with each other. No problem there whatsoever. Then they went to commercial, came back. Tony Schiavone was in the back ready to interview the former two dimes, Cole Carter, who was just released from NXT uh, for a, a substance policy violation, wellness pile, uh, violation. Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs came through. Stark said the last time we saw Carter, he was sleeping with the fishes and a reference to him being killed off on NXT by Tony D'Angelo. Starks, who's the FTW champion, has now got a open challenge gimmick going and challenged him for later on in the show. That led into the Blackpool Combat Club of John Moxley and ROH Pure Champion Wheeler Yuta, defeating the best friends of Trent Beretta and Chuck Taylor. Orange Cassidy and William Regal joined Excalibur and Taz on commentary. During the match, Taz noted that Trent Beretta never liked Wheeler Yuta as the old alliance between best friends and Yuta was invoked a few times. The match went through one commercial break when little, a little under 12 minutes and at the end of the match, Yuta was in peril trying to get to his corner for the tag. Uh, Moxley to Moxley kept getting cut off. Chuck Taylor tagged in. 
ran right into a jumping guillotine from Yuta as Trent tried to come into the ring. Moxley yanked him off the apron, put him in the figure four out on the floor. As that was going on, Taylor uh, reversed the guillotine with a suplex into the corner. Chuck went for the awful waffle, but Yuta reversed it into the seatbelt clutch roll-up, and he got the victory. I believe the only words that Orange uttered the entire time was at the very end of the match where he said, Chuck taught him that one before he took off the headphones and walked to the back. Then there was a video package for the ROH world title match coming up. Claudio against Jonathan Gresham. Swerve in our glory time. The AEW Tag Team Championship celebration. Keith Lee, Swerve Strickland, Tony Schiavone hosted this. Kevin Gates was shown in the front row with a flute of champagne in his hand. Swerve says that as a hip-hop mogul that he invited him. Keith asked Kevin when the deluxe edition of his new album was coming out before thanking the fans and challenging the entire division to get at him. Lee said it was time for a toast when smart Mark, smart Mark Sterling and Tony Nese came out. Sterling is still petitioning for Swerve to be fired. I know this really gets under Brian's skin. I think the fact that he is such a cartoon character gimmick lawyer i i think it works he says the majority of the locker room has already signed this petition to get swerve out of there and uh niece starts to make himself you know, at home with the cake and the champagne they had out there grabs himself a glass sticks his finger in the cake keith lee looked very upset about that sterling said they only need one more name on that petition and said gates could be that man said after mistaking him for a young ma though which Kind of made me laugh. Made reference to Gates' song, Two Phones, before he and Nice moved right in front of him, asked him to do the right thing for the AEW roster, and signed the petition to kill off Swerve. Gates refused. Sterling poked at his chest, says he's just like Swerve, he's untrustworthy, and his music sucks. It's not true. New album Kaza out right now. But... That got Gates out from behind the guardrail. Sterling backed off, screaming that if he gets touched, he'll sue. So instead, Gates went chest to chest with Tony Nese, sort of. I mean, it was a ridiculous visual in that Kevin Gates is like 6'2 and is at least six inches taller than Tony Nese and like has 75 pounds on him. Most of it on the arms and the shoulders and the upper body. Nice asked him what he was going to do, so Gates. Just grabbed him by his necklace and punched him right in the face. And it's not like it killed Tony Nese or anything, but he hit him in the face. So I believe it. <laughs> Dropped Tony Nese. That was that. From behind, Smart Mark Sterling. Swerve picked up the cake. And when Sterling turned around, cake in the face, and it looked great. The greatest cake face in pro wrestling history. Sorry, Cornette. Sorry, anybody that's done that gimmick before. Before uh, they end up going to commercial, Swerve goes over. He poses. West Side Gun is also in the crowd. They don't mention him, but he's ringside, so the fly god is there. After a break backstage, John Silver and Alex Reynolds did a bunch of, or Alan Reynolds, whatever the hell his name, a bunch of bad comedy is what was done, really, with those Dark Order guys with the Butcher and the Blade over a T-shirt that said, Butch, it wasn't very good. Silver and Reynolds got beat up. They deserve to for, for having that shirt and doing this comedy. Hangman Adam Page ran in with a chair and ran the heels off. There was one good part where, you know, at the end where they're just like, you know, heavy breathing and rolling around on the ground before they, they fade out. Page goes, you know, you guys all right? And, and Silver said no. And I thought that was funny. Christian Cage and Luchasaurus then defeated the Varsity Blondes of Griff Garrison and Brian Pillman Jr. Luchasaurus basically destroyed both guys before tagging in Christian so he could get the cheap pin on Pillman. After the match, Christian got on Luchasaurus' shoulders and did the Jurassic Express pose. Jungle Mute Boy's music hit and Key came down with a chair. Luchasaurus was blocking the ring as, as Jungle Boy came down. But then the Dinosaur Man turned to the side, stood next to Jungle Boy, stared at Christian. As Jungle Boy goes to get in the ring, Christian goes haul-assing out of it, not only through the crowd, goes up the steps, goes into a concourse. He's out of there, gone. What does this mean? Could it be a swerve? We'll have to find out next week. The Gun Club challenged the acclaim to a blaze battle between Austin and Max Caster, a freestyle battle between the two sides. 
At that point in the show, Jim Ross joined commentary FTW Championship Ricky Starks, babyface Cole Carter, the former Two Dimes, went six minutes. It felt longer than that. The, by the end of the match, the crowd was booing Carter. I mean, there's several reasons for that, in my opinion, not the least of which is Starks is a truth machine out there. He is absolute. If you have a little bit of vanilla in your interview, he's going to outshine you. His presence just standing there outshines people. So when you wrestle a match for six minutes, you have this smiling baby face who was the former two dimes. People are wondering why this isn't on elevation. This isn't on dark. It's it's not even on rampage. It's on dynamite. Does this guy deserve this shot? Did he do anything to stand out? Not really, no. And I think the crowd kind of recognized that. Didn't do anything wrong or anything really badly, but he didn't get any reaction. And Ricky Starks absolutely outshone him, made a challenge after the match for anybody to come out. Dan Housen does. He takes the challenge for next week, another FTR championship match. I like this gimmick going on with Ricky Starks facing different people each week. Then it was time for the FTR promo. You heard the second half. The first half was Cash Wheeler talking about the Briscoes and really concentrating on that. We had a segment with Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satnam Singh backstage. Lethal was complaining that Samoa Joe was not there. Christopher Daniels came up, defended Joe's honor, and then challenged Lethal for Friday Night Rampage, which was accepted. Tag match, Jay Cargill and Kira Hogan with Stokely Hathaway and Jermaine Dupree against defeated Athena and Willow Nightingale. This was the most hip-hop-oriented show it, both with Kevin Gates actually being openly out there. Same thing with Dupree sitting next to Stokely at ringside, but gun. There was a, a Wu Tang Clan reference. It, it was really, it was something else. It was supposed to be a six woman with Layla Gray and Chris Statlander, but Gray couldn't perform. Cargill and Hogan got the victory. Uh, Tony Storm and Thunder Rosa. It was announced Rosa is going to be facing Miyu Yamashita next week. And Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter interrupted their interview. And I thought challenged them for Friday night, but apparently not because in the package that aired afterwards, they just said Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter were going to be in action. So I'm not sure against who. And then it was time for the main event. Barbed Wire Everywhere match. Chris Jericho, Eddie Kingston. Carnage everywhere. Real barbs were used. Men were busted open and bleeding. Everything was wrapped in barbed wire. They had a shark wrapped in barbed wire, not a real one. The, the ring bell was in barbed wire. The microphone was in barbed wire. They bled everywhere. I'll go into a little more detail after the break, but the bottom line is Chris Jericho gets the victory, but Eddie Kingston got revenge at the end putting Jericho through a big board full of barbed wire as the show went off the air. We'll be right back. Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, producer Dom. Jokes between the break. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper Vivi. We are back. Barbed wire match, as I mentioned. A couple more details from it. I'm sure everybody out there is already aware of what took place. I mean, hats on hats in this one, boy. There was gimmicks on top of gimmicks. You had the Jericho Appreciation Society trapped in a shark cage that was above the ring. During the match, down came, uh, I almost said Anna J. It's not. It's Ty Conti. She ran down, attacked Ruby Soho, who was the official key keeper. And then all of a sudden, Anna J, her good friend, runs down. Seems like they're going to fight as she, she pulls Ty off. But then Anna J turns dirty, attacks Ruby. They steal the damn key. They run up. They attempt to, and they and they get the the you know, just like Ole Anderson in 1990 at Capital Combat. They they get the device and they they raise the cage up, or they they raise they lower down the shark cage. And out come the Jericho Appreciation Society, but they can't get the key to unlock the the lock. So then they actually have to slide through. And everybody's so slim they could do it, except for Matt Menard. I don't know how he got out because he couldn't get between the bars because his head's so big he would have gotten stuck in there. Like you see like TikTok videos of like, you know, people with a deer or a baby cub or a squirrel with their head caught in the deck. That's what he would have looked like. But somehow he got out. They all attempt, uh, attempted to kick Kingston's ass. But then out came the Blackpool Combat Club. Out came Ortiz, chased all them off. And all that stuff that went just went on, Chris Jericho got the victory. But at the very end, at the very end, Kingston fought back. 
picked Jericho up, threw him through a barbed wire spider web to end the shows that went off the air. And what a better way for me to go off the air. I won't be with you tomorrow. Brian Alvarez will. So he'll talk to you again after a while.